It's easy to get overwhelmed and off track at many points during the renovation or build process, and that can cost time and money. The more a homeowner can do in the beginning, the better off things are going to go. But let's be real. Being a homeowner during a renovation takes a lot of time and effort. Even if you have an unlimited budget and can outsource almost every element of a project, you still need to be involved. I mean, it's your house. And I bet almost no one, if not, in fact, literally no one, has a budget and a mindset that really allows them to outsource it all. If that was the case, no one would be listening. I have a friend who is in the early stages of a remodel. She and her husband are just starting to talk to architects about the project, and of course I have been offering some advice on how to best think about what they want and how to prepare to have those conversations. Yesterday she remarked to me that she felt like it was already a part-time job, on top of her full-time job and family and life. And she's right. Going through a renovation or a build is absolutely like having another job. And it's a job you are paying to do, not one someone is paying you for. It takes a ton of time, not constantly, but off and on throughout the process, and requires lots of thought, decisions, and planning. And I'm going to keep saying this, but the more you can do in the early stages, the clearer you can be about what you want and what you like and what you can spend, the easier it will all be throughout the entire journey. Look around your house. What's right with it? What's wrong? You obviously are thinking about a renovation because something isn't working, or you are starting from scratch with a new build, or you bought a house but it needs work before you can move in. Regardless of the scenario, your goal is a better living space and a better living experience. If you listened to the first episode of this podcast, you know that when I met my husband, he was about to start a renovation that ultimately touched every room of his house. You also know it started because his dishwasher broke. And you also know about the god-awful kitchen wallpaper. So here's what went down. The dishwasher broke. It was super old and needed to be replaced. In looking around the kitchen, he realized the whole room could really use an update and that it made sense to do it at the same time. He wasn't planning on moving, but he does really like to cook and entertain, so he wanted a good kitchen. And then he met his new neighbor who had her own design build firm, And she helped him not only with the kitchen, but also with fixing an old popcorn ceiling, renovating two bathrooms, including enlarging the ensuite bathroom in the primary bedroom, and renovating the basement apartment that he used as an office at the time. One room was tackled at a time, and other than losing use of the kitchen for a bit, he was able to live in the house during the renovation, shifting to the guest room to sleep while the primary bedroom was being worked on. And the renovation was very fortuitous. Not long after it was finished, we got engaged, decided to live in New York where I lived instead of D.C. where he did, and had a completely renovated, shiny and bright, ready-to-list house, no other work needed. But in hindsight, it was a combination of Luck and Sandy, the design build woman, that made the project successful. No ding on my husband at all, but knowing how the project started, it's clear he did not spend any time in a dream stage thinking about this project. And he certainly didn't spend any time in a design-defined stage. His project just kind of unfurled bit by bit until there was no room left in the house to touch. And that is one way to go about it. I don't mean the piecemeal part. I know sometimes it's totally necessary for financial or other reasons to tackle one part of a renovation at a time. I mean the fact that there was no vision or plan or true forethought that went into it. There were so many opportunities and ways it could have really gone sideways. When you are thinking about a remodel or build, the more you can, in fact, think and dream about it, the better off you will be and the smoother the process will go. You want to think not just about what you want in your house, but how you live in it and how what you want jives with how you live. One important thing to keep in mind, what is your goal for the renovation? Is this your first home and you need to make it more livable? Is this your forever home where you will raise kids if you have any? Or do you plan to live here, say, five to eight years, then move? Nowadays, you don't have to just live in one home your entire adult life, just like you don't have to keep the same job for 40 years. And while you may not even remotely be thinking of selling, what is the neighborhood like and what are the property values? You don't want to spend hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars on a home in an area where the other property values will never rise above, say, four hundred dollars or $500,000. You might love your house while you live in it, 
but be mighty unhappy when you do decide it's time to sell and move on. I know I mentioned some of that before, but it bears repeating. Next up, you need to get clear on who has input in this process and how much. I'd like to think it goes without saying that if you are married or doing this with a significant other, then you both have equal say, or at least the option for equal say, as I know sometimes one spouse could care less. How will any differences that arise be handled? And what about any kids? Do they get input in their rooms, into other public spaces in the house? I think it's important that everyone who lives in the house gets to be a part of the process in some way, especially in the dream stage. But you also need to be clear about ultimately how decisions get made and by whom. The end goal of the dream stage is to create a document called a creative brief that you can use in talking to architects about your project. Did you notice that the title of this episode is Start Where You Want to End Up? Having a concept document that talks about just that, what problems you want to solve and where you want to end up in your house, will help tremendously as you move through your renovation journey. Think of it this way. Every house has a foundation, and it needs to be strong to function as it should. The same is true for how you approach a remodel or build. The stronger your foundation, your creative brief and then subsequent scope of work, the better off you will be in the execution phase. I'll circle back to the concept of a creative brief and how to create one in a few minutes. Basically, there are two sides to dream. The first is how you need and want your house to work, and the second is how you want your house to look and feel. So how do you want your house to work? We'll tackle this part first since it's not quite as exciting as how you want it to look and feel, but it is equally, if not more important. Think about house flow. We have all heard the saying, form follows function. And if you have a clear vision on how your house needs to function, it will be easier to make style choices down the road and end up with a house that not only looks and feels the way you want it to, but lets you live the way you want to live. Think through a typical day. How does each member of the family move through the house? Where are meals eaten? Homework done? Where do people hang out? The more detailed you can be, the better. Literally, I want you to take pen to paper and document everyone's journey from the time they wake up until they go to sleep on a typical weekday and weekend. What works? Where are the bottlenecks or trouble spots? Do you come in from a garage or a driveway or the street? And is your house set up to properly accommodate that? Or do you come in from different places depending on where you're coming from? For example, coming in from the store versus walking the dog. Where do you instinctively drop your stuff? In the upcoming See Jane Build online course, we will have templates and checklists for all of this. But for now, just dot it down, jot it down however works for you. Don't laugh at this one, but are there unused or underused rooms in your house? I know, on the surface you're like, ha, who has homes with unused rooms? Especially after COVID turned our homes into homes, gyms, offices, and schools. But it happens. In Brooklyn, we lived in a newly built townhouse that was modern and wonderful. The dining room had a double height ceiling with a wall of glass opening to the small postage stamp sized yard. The living room on the second floor had two areas to it. One where we put the big comfy sectional and the TV, and then a slightly smaller space where we had a love seat and some chairs. But technically, it was one big open space, and we never used the love seat area. I mean, in the 13 years we lived in that house, I can maybe count on two hands the amount of time anyone spent sitting in that area. It was just a pass-through as you walked up to the bedrooms. It was great for those times we had parties and needed all that space, but day-to-day, it was a complete waste. I think if we hadn't known we were moving when COVID started, that would have been the time to really think about a better use for it. Though the way it had been designed, with absolutely no privacy, it would have been quite a challenge. Be careful that you don't get into a trap thinking that you need bigger and bigger houses to meet your needs, and that an addition needs to be a part of any remodel. You might need more literal space, yes, but it's also possible that an architect can help you repurpose and or rearrange how your spaces currently work without necessarily adding to the footprint. Do you like to cook? Even if you don't, do you do it frequently? I know it's very possible to not enjoy it, but still have to do it every day. As an aside, I know all of us, even those of us who love it, like myself, did way too much of it over the past couple of years during the pandemic. 
Even Ina Garden, who I love, 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 recently said that even she got burnt out on having to cook three meals a day nonstop for so long. I felt so validated hearing that, that if she was burnt out, it was okay for me to feel that way too. But anyway, back to the kitchen, your kitchen, and the task at hand. How do you move through it if you're cooking? Do you have ample storage? Do you move easily from fridge to counter to sink? What do you look at when you're washing dishes or when you're chopping vegetables? Is there enough space for two people to be cooking or cleaning up in the kitchen at the same time? And does it matter? Do you need a better oven, another dishwasher, a bigger fridge? Do you need to be able to see children wherever you are in the house or in the public spaces, or are they old enough to be alone? Do you have pets? Do you entertain a lot, so need a separate dining room? Or if it's okay to have one space that works for both everyday dining and entertaining? What happens in the evening? Does everyone hang out together in one room or retreat to their separate spaces? Is your bedroom next to your child's? Do you want it or need it to be? Are there enough bathrooms and are they in the right place? Depending on the scope of the project, you may not be able to change everything. But now is the time to think about it all so you can prioritize what needs to be done. And I know that it goes without saying, 99% of people are going to say that one of the biggest issues in their current home is lack of storage. When think about thinking about function, really think about the usual versus the exception. If you have house guests a few times a year, but your teen likes to have friends over a lot to watch movies, it may make sense to have a hangout room with a sofa bed versus a dedicated guest room. That's what we did, and my daughter and her friends love the fact that if they want to, they can open the bed and stretch out on it while watching a film. Likewise, if you only host big meals a few times a year, you may not want a dedicated dining room, depending on what the other options are for everyday eating. I know I'm throwing a lot of questions out here, but the more you can understand how about how you use your house, the easier it will be to communicate to an architect what needs to change. All right, now let's talk about look and feel. I know you've been waiting for this so you can binge watch HGTV and spend hours doing online window shopping. I recommend that you set up a separate email account for the project that you and your spouse or partner, if you have one, can both have access to. Even if you have accounts already, use this email to create new accounts on things like Howls and Pinterest and for correspondence with architects, contractors, etc., this way, all things renovation will be in the same place. You will also be able to give access to your accounts on sites like Pinterest to your architect and anyone else involved in the build, since the email used to create it is not connected to the rest of your life. Online, try to be as organized and specific as possible. What do I mean by that? Create boards or albums for each room and or category of project component. Think kitchen or exterior or fixtures. Whatever makes sense for the scope of your project and how you like to think. Be as detailed as possible in the notes when you save something. Don't just say, cool shower. Say, I like the way they did that niche shelf for shampoos. Or, I love the barn door style sliding shower door. Remember, other people on your team may look at these when you are not there to explain. So the more clarity, the better. Some people love the idea of scrolling house porn, as they say but others feel overwhelmed before even starting. If you fall in the latter group, try to do it in small increments. Spend 15 to 30 minutes at a time and search for focused elements like flooring or kitchen cabinets. Try and be detailed in your search to help you clarify what styles you like. So for example, search for kitchen by a color or by a style like modern or you know, contemporary, or I guess that's the same thing, so, or country kitchen, and see what images and what styles you like the best. Offline, think about a system that would work for you. I am a big fan of binders. For my projects, I set up the offline like this. I get a binder, a bunch of dividers, and a bunch of clear three-hole punched sheet protectors. Let's say it's a new build. I would have tabs for each room of the house, in addition to ones for the exterior, meaning literally the outside of the house itself. Outside, meaning the yard, pool area, if there is one, I would also add in tabs for, but that would be different. I would also have tabs for elements like contracts and budgets and timelines, but for now, let's just focus on the inspiration ones. 
Any sheet I tore out of a magazine would go into a clear sheet protector and then into the binder in the correct spot. But, and this is important, like with any online clippings, I want to be as clear as I can be about why I've saved something. So I circle elements on the page and make notes on them before slipping them into the protectors. And yes, before you asked, I was the girl who could not wait to go school supply shopping every August. Binders work for me, but you find what works for you. It could be manila folders or a standing magazine file or just a plastic bin. Just some, just figure out some way to try and keep things organized. While you want to get a good sense of what you like and to be able to convey that, there can be too much time looking for inspiration. Limit yourself to a certain number of photos in each category, for example, or you could spend days on end in the black hole of home photos. Hopefully there will be clear patterns that emerge of what you like style and color wise. Save as much as you want to start, but try to cull down to two to four images per room or category. Hopefully, if you went crazy and, say, saved 20, in 20 images for your bedroom, you should be able to look through them, see the patterns, and cull it down to just a small handful. Like with clothes, don't feel compelled to follow the trends. In most cases, you're going to live in your house for many years, and remodels are not an annual event. The style you land on needs to serve you well for a long time. If this is just a partial remodel, let's say the kitchen, since that is one of the most popular rooms, remember that it needs to fit in with the rest of the house. Don't go for a sleek modern kitchen if the rest of your house is squarely in a traditional style. How are you going to work with your spouse or partner on this style and vision piece of the project? I know I talked about creating a separate jointly accessed email account, but beyond that, who and how will decisions be made regarding the overall, st overall style? I know sometimes one spouse has free reign, sometimes it's shared equally, and sometimes it's a little bit more of a gray area. If you have the time, here's an exercise to see if you two are on the same page when it comes to style. Set aside a time period, could be 20 minutes, 15 minutes. Each of you spend that time on the same website or at the same copies of the same home magazines. Without looking at what the other is doing, save or earmark rooms and elements you like. Don't worry so much about the practical side of things right now, like can we afford this? Will this really work in our space? Just bookmark things. No need to even save it to your official remodel boards. At the end of the time period, look at what you each saved. Fingers crossed there is so some overlap. If not, now is the time to figure out how are you going to handle it. Now back to the elusive creative brief that I mentioned. At this point, you've spent time thinking about how you live in your home, what's working and what's not working about your house, and how you need it to function going forward. You also spent time, probably way too much time, finding images of how you want your home to look and feel. Now it's time to combine those into a document you can use to move through the next phases of the renovation journey. A creative brief, sometimes called a design brief, or you can even call it a home brief, is a document that helps with goal setting, communication, and focus. It allows you to easily share with others your dreams and needs for your house in a format that they can easily work from. It's where the starting point is for the pretty, how you want your house to look, and the practical, how you need to live in it. I don't want to freak anyone out and have you think you need to write a term paper or a PowerPoint presentation here. It can be a simple Word document or even Excel spreadsheet. Combined with access, of course, to the images you like on the look and feel side. But hey, if you love PowerPoint, then knock yourself out. It can have sentences or just bullet points. The idea is to communicate in as detailed a way as you know, given that you are not an architect or a contractor, what you want to have happen. First off, include your goal. This can be something like, I need to create more room for my growing family, or the layout of our house doesn't work for how we live, or we need to change the kitchen so that two people can cook at once. It can be more than one thing. Heck, it can be more than two. But there needs to be at least one goal or overarching problem you're trying to solve. Here is an example of a big picture goal for a whole house renovation. Overall, we like the style of our house, but need to make the spaces more functional for our family. There seems to be a lot of wasted space or space we don't use in the house, while other areas are too tight. We also want to have a better flow and use of our outdoor space. We want to keep as much natural light as possible. 
You can and should also have what I call a values or feeling statement that can help get across how you want your home to feel. Something like, I want my home to feel warm and inviting where friends feel comfortable just dropping by. Or, I want my house to be where my teens and her friends hang out. Or, I want to feel like I am on vacation in my own house. Or, I want my house to feel sleek and cool. You get the idea. Next in the brief, who lives in the house? How old are they? Are there pets? And how any of that, if at all, will change in the next five years? Planning a playroom for a young child doesn't always translate to teens having a hangout room, so the more info on ages and stages, the better the results will be. Then, what and where are you trying to solve? As an example, you can say things like, My children are too old to share a room, so we need to give them their own rooms, but also have a dedicated home office space. The kitchen doesn't have enough storage. The indoor-outdoor flow is not working. Now that my daughter is a teen, we need another full bathroom, etc. We need a hangout room for the kids that has a door so we don't have to hear them. We need new flooring throughout the house. This can be on one big list. This can be broken out by room. Whatever's easiest for you. Don't hesitate to include the things you love about your current home and that are working, since you probably want to preserve those things. And if you don't tell someone you love them, they won't know. Just be sure also to put down everything you think you need you need and you want, and also maybe what you don't. In a creative brief, you do not need to get so into the weeds where you were talking about fixtures and colors. From an aesthetic perspective, the brief just needs to convey overall style so the house can be designed that way. But don't worry, there will be time to go into all the details as you move through the design and define stage. If you're building from scratch, or really doing a big renovation, this is a great time to think about rearranging your home. For example, are rooms near each other that you wish weren't, or ones that should be aren't? And are your current bedrooms large, but really all you do is sleep in them, so maybe they don't need to be so big? Or is the kitchen on one side of the house, but you would love it to be near the outdoors? One thing you want to be careful about is don't think that you know the solution or that there is only one solution. What do I mean? Well, when we built our house on the North Fork, I had a document, my creative brief, some images, and I had even sketched a potential floor plan before our meeting with an architect. And I kind of liked what I had drawn. I mean, not the level of drawing, but I liked the layout. And it really helped me get clarity on what rooms we needed. But He was the professional, not me. So I had to let go, so to speak, and not be wed to my version of the floor plan. His drawing wasn't too far off, and the important thing was he did include all of our must-have elements. His way made the flow of the house so much better than my rudimentary drawing. But because I had done the drawing and we had given him a brief that we discussed with him, we barely had any changes to his first pass, thereby saving us time and money. Let's pause for a second and talk about sustainability. It goes without saying we all care about our planet and climate change and want to do our part to not muck things up even more. For some people, that means recycling more or using less paper towels. But if you are able, a renovation is a great place to address sustainability in your home. I'm not going to go too much into it in this episode, but if you have been thinking about things like solar power, home battery backup systems, tank to, tanks to capture and reuse rainwater, etc., those desires need to be included in your creative brief. I know they are more about the systems of your house versus the function or the look and feel, but they need to be designed for just the way any other system in your house does as well, and an architect might not you know, default to, oh, this is what you're going to do. Likewise, talk to your architect from the get-go, especially if you are building or making big changes, about your home's orientation so that you can make sure the rooms that would benefit the most from natural light are the ones situated in a place that garners the most natural light. You don't want to waste amazing light that lasts all day on a bedroom you only use for sleeping. That light would be way better served in a kitchen or family room or office. Maximizing and leveraging the light will also have an impact on your heating and cooling systems. Okay, back to the brief. We talked about how this is a document document to communicate what you want out of this project and out of your house in a way that architects or whomever can take the ball and run with it to produce a design. 
But of course, we would be completely remiss if we didn't talk about budget. We talked in an earlier episode about having a ballpark sense of budget and what you can afford to spend before you start. But now we here we are in the dream stage, basically dreaming unrestrained, so to speak, about the things we would love. Totally new kitchen with high-end range and two dishwashers, more storage in every room, etc. We've clipped photos of cool primary bathrooms with double vanities and giant walk-in showers, or bifold doors that let the living room completely open to the backyard. And while doing all that, I bet we barely thought about cost. At this point, unless you have a friend or a relative who is a contractor, you likely still won't know exactly what things cost. An architect can help a bit on that front, but it's still not their job. We will talk more about budgeting, I promise. But for now, what you need to think about are priorities. What are your priorities in this remodel or build? Is it to have indoor-outdoor flow? Is it to have an amazing kitchen? Let's say you would love to have a fireplace in your bedroom. Sounds so cozy, right? But you also love to entertain and cook, and your kitchen is tight. So in the remodel, you want a larger kitchen with a big high-end range and two dishwashers. Well, let's say you have to choose between two dishwashers in the kitchen and a fireplace in your bedroom. Now, that won't be the choice, and those are small items in the scheme of things, but it's a good tangible way to think about it. Which of those things, bedroom, fireplace, or extra dishwasher, will make your house work better? Which gets you closer to the goals that you documented in the first part of your creative brief? Just think about all that now, even though you don't have to quite make decisions yet. My husband laughs at me because when I pack for a trip, I start way early. I take out all the things I think I want to pack, and I think about it in terms of, okay, day one, what am I going to wear during the day while we do X? And then do I need another day outfit if we are also going to do Y or go to the pool? And what do I need for the evening if I need something different than what I wore during the day? I take out everything I want to take, and then I start to pare back, to compromise and prioritize. What do I really need to take and really want to take? I forgot to mention that I almost always carry on my bags, so I need to pare down to make it work. I find it the most challenging when it's winter and I'm going someplace warm, because of course I want to take all my cute summer dresses that I haven't worn in months. I'm like, okay, I only have this one week, so I need to wear all of them before I'm back in cooler weather. It's normal to apply that logic to a renovation. I'm only going to do this renovation once, so I need everything I can think of to be in this remodel. But unless you're made of money, you likely will need to look at everything on your wish list and ultimately say, what am I really going to wear on this trip? What do I really, really care about? Once you've gotten this document done and you have your creative brief, it's time to share it with the world. Well, at least with a few architects, as you take the next step towards making your build or renovation a reality. We'll talk about that in an upcoming episode.